Welcome to our Facebook Live chat about mortgages and student loans. Um, I am often getting questions from potential buyers about how their student loans will impact their ability to get a mortgage. Or people assume, oh, I have this student loan situation in my life and I'm, I can't buy until I pay them off. So I really wanted to get a mortgage expert in here to talk to us about how student loans really uh, impact the ability to get a mortgage and your ability to buy a home, whether that's for personal use or investment. My name is Roz Dupitant with At Home Downtown at Keller Williams. And I have invited Dana Zito, one of my favorite mortgage people, here to give us the skinny um, on how lenders really view student loans, the payments and all that stuff. So join us, stay on. I'm going to bring Dana in now. Dana, are you there? Hi, hi, Rods. How are you? Hi there. Good to see you. You too. Um, so yeah, one of the things I, you know, I was just telling everybody that, um, you know, one of the frequently asked questions I get is about student loans. Uh, in downtown Chicago, where I'm working with a lot of buyers and sellers, a lot of the people have a lot of education. Yep. So they have degrees and they, you know, have maybe have law school and medical school in their background. And often that comes with hefty loans. So for me, I, you know, when I, you knew me when I was working on my MBA and that came along with <laughs> student loans. So this is something that is um, near and dear to my heart in terms yeah. of questions that buyers have. So I wanted to just ask you a few things. But first, I want to get your um, your 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 background a little bit. So Dana um, Dana Zito, she's with B Mortgage here in Chicago, and yep. she knows everything about everything <laughs> with, as it relates to mortgages. It's and your she, kind. Yeah, um, and what she doesn't know she will research, which I really love about a person. That is correct. Um, she and I have worked together on deals for several years. She's actually done a loan for for us personally. Um, so I can sort of vouch for her work and her approach to lending, um, which is in line with, with what I like. So, Dana, tell us a little bit about, you know, ha have you seen a lot with student loans and people yes. with questions about that? Yes. And I would say the vast majority of my borrowers do have student loans and they are actively purchasing and able to qualify for mortgages, whether it's a conventional loan, a jumbo loan, an FHA loan, um, but many, many buyers do have them. I would say the majority do versus those that don't. Yeah, um, so it's definitely possible yeah. to, to purchase Absolutely. with a student. Okay, yeah. good, because mm -hmm. that's what I've been telling people. Um, yes. <laughs> so let's, let's dig in here a little bit. So because yeah. people may not always understand, they, they look at a loan balance and think, Oh, this is so approved. much. I'll yeah. never get approved. How does having student loans of whatever size really impact a buyer's uh, mortgage qualifications? So I would say a general rule of thumb is to look at your overall amount, your balance. And when in doubt, the rule of thumb has always been take 1% and use that as your monthly payment. That can okay. be low for some people in comparison to what the actual um, student loan pay payment is, or it can be quite high. And it, it tends to depend on whether your loans are in repayment or if they're in deferment um, or forbearance. And it also depends on if you're getting a loan that's backed by Fannie Mae or Freddie Mac or even FHA. Okay, so, so that's a, wait, I'm gonna pause <laughs> you right there because that's a lot. And yeah. I know you know a lot, so I know you will go into um, some of this lingo and different things. So yeah. when you talk about, let's let's stay with the loan for a minute and talk about what you said about repayment, forbearance yeah. or what, whatever, and, and what mm -hmm. are some of the differences there? So the difference uh, between repayment is you've, you've graduated, your, your loans are in repayment, you're making the monthly payment on them. Um, deferment typically happens when you're still in school, um, or there's an, some sort of financial hardship, um, you can you can go into forbearance too, and that's typically for um, private student loans um, until you're 
until you're either you've you've gained employment again or you've joined the military, things like that can actually put your loans into de deferment. Um, and it depends on where you've gotten your loan, if it's a private loan or if it's a federal loan. Um, each different lender will have different requirements for how long you can defer the payments. And that's what that term means. So if you have deferred your payments, you're, you're actively just accruing interest on the loan and you're not making a monthly payment on it. Okay. Um, and that, that really tends to be what's most important for us as a lender in trying to qualify you is determining, are you, are you paying your student loan? Is it in repayment? Are you paying it at the interest rate that you had, um, you know, borrowed, or is it in deferment where you're pushing it off a little bit until you're finished with school? Um, and at that point, we can determine um, what your actual payment will be, um, or if your payment will be zero, which is possible if you're on an income based repayment plan in the future, we can even qualify you with that. But it really does come down to if your, if your loans are in repayment or deferment, and what type of financing you're trying to get. Okay. And if if your loan is in deferment, it mm -hmm. obviously, like you said, you're not pay making any payments. How does a lender look at that if you're trying to get a mortgage? Say you have income and you're you know, working full time, but you are also in grad school or part time or something like yeah. that. How is that viewed typically? So if the payment, if we pull credit and we, sh we see the loan itself and it has a balance, but it doesn't have a monthly payment, um, we can do a couple different things. We can ask that you go to your servicer and obtain a um, student loan, a student loan payment um, statement. And even if it's not actively in repayment, typically you can get a statement showing what your payment will be. And Got if that's it. the case, we can go ahead and use that amount. Um, if you're on an income-based payment plan, we can get the documentation to verify that the actual monthly payment is zero we can qualify you with a zero monthly payment. Interesting. Yes. Um, okay. Generally, so, the income, so for people who don't know, the income-based repayment plans are what exactly? Um, income-based repayment, they're four different types of, um, usually if they've taken a, a job or they're studying to become a certain like service-based industry or um, healthcare, I think social work, teachers, I believe, are all included. Um, so but, the payment will be a little reduced, you know, from what it otherwise yeah. would be based on other factors. Um, so I is it not in the medical field? That's yeah. most who I've run into it with. Okay, because they have typically high, very high loan balances, and so they will, at least at the start of their careers, have a little mm -hmm. bit lower than what the lender might might, also, might otherwise require. Yes. Okay. So you can use that lower amount to qualify. Yeah. Okay. If that's actually what it will be. And you're on an income driven payment plan. Yes. Um, if, if the loan is deferred or if it's in forbearance, we could use 1% of the outstanding balance, even if that's lower than the fully amortizing payment. So everything kind of goes back to 1%. Um, right. And that's for Fannie Mae. Freddie Mac is actually changing as of today. Oh, wow. Yeah. Okay. As of today. Yeah, so there's some new rules on that, and the new requirements are essentially if the payment's greater than zero, we use the actual monthly payment reported on credit, okay, um, or whatever we can obtain from the student loan provider. Um, if it's reported as zero on credit, which happens a lot, a lot of times we do see a zero dollar monthly payment on credit, um, we can use 0.5 percent of the outstanding balance. So that's come down. Um, oh wow! Just as okay. a yeah, um, FHA is a little brand brand bit more strict. Yeah, so great news there because um, it one percent can even be a hefty amount, but it seems that they're responding to a greater demand and the fact that people are, you know, it's very common to have student loans. So the more able people are quali are to qualify, the better chances of them becoming homeowners. Okay, so let let me stop you there. Let's talk about debt because. Overall debt and where student loans fit into that is often something that people don't always know either. Yeah. So mm -hmm. can you talk a little bit about debt ratios with yeah. Fannie versus Freddie versus FHA? And mm -hmm. again, we know that it depends on an individual situation, but some generalities would be great. Sure. So 
the easiest way to figure out your debt ratios is to take your gross, so pre-tax monthly income, multiply that by 0.45, and that's the maximum that we like to see people um, having outstanding as far as liabilities go. So Okay, so that's everything. That's like that's car everything. payments and student that's loan payments, cards. And credit cards, everything. Yeah. Okay. Plus the expected mortgage payment or housing payment on the new property. Yep. So that that is what makes up your debt to income ratio. It's a very simple formula. Um, again, anyone can calculate it themselves. If you know what your gross monthly um, salary is, you multiply that by 0.45. That gives you a number, a dollar amount, essentially. And within that number, you need to encompass your new housing payment and any other minimum monthly payments that you make on um, credit cards car payments, student loans, things of that sort. We don't look at utilities mostly and other living expenses even, so. Okay, it's strictly about debt. That's good yeah. to know. Mm -hmm. And then is there a difference in what ratio will be allowable under different kinds of loans? So Freddie versus Fannie versus FHA? Yeah, I mean, in generally, generally we, we look at anywhere from 36% being ideal for conventional mm -hmm. up to, um, or jumbo. Um, realistically, people are much closer, I would say, to 43% to 45%. We can get an approval up to 50 and even beyond for a really well-qualified buyer, and that's on conventional and FHA. It really comes down okay. to their underwriting systems and um, the the way that they calculate your overall score as a buyer, and that looks at credit. So this is yeah. yeah, this is starting to 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 really put some meat behind the thing that we always say, which is it really depends on your situation, right? So we try to get people to some general, give them some general info, but as you can see, you know, people who are maybe you know tuning in, um, there. It, it really depends on your specific situation because your student loan and how that's counted, the yeah. minimums of other debt, but then it has to do with your qualifications in terms of the ratios that a lender will allow. So it, it really is, yeah, it, it's individual. Specific, and, it, it, and it even depends on where you choose to get financing because most direct lenders have access to Fannie Mae programs, Freddie Mac programs, FHA programs. And it's important that we know from the outset what your unique um, situation is so that we can guide you towards the one that best suits your needs. Um, I could imagine that, you know, somebody was getting a loan through a certain lender that only offered FHA or only offered a Fannie Mae program versus Freddie yeah. Mac. They didn't have, they didn't realize kind of the, the ins and outs of um, how, how uniquely they qualify people based on the, the amount of the debt and whether or not they're paying it. Yeah, a lot of times when I'm first encountering buyers, people tend to think that the mortgage qualification step or the mortgage pre-approval is just sort of a passport to get agents like me to show them properties. And I try to get people to really engage with a lender that they can trust who has a really good understanding of different products because as you can see, it makes a big difference. Sure. Um, when you're able to point to, to many things. Okay, so let's jump back in with these student loans here. So um, what difference does having a government loan versus a private loan make or and how can people tell which they have? So federal loans, um, they're typically more favorable because they can have fixed rates and even the income-based repayment plans. Um, that are typically not offered with private loans. Private loans are generally more expensive. Um, and although it's a little confusing with the Fannie Mae and the Ginnie Mae that refer to the government sponsored enterprises that, that back our loans, Sally Mae, which is a large provider of student loans, is actually not a federal loan provider. They are private. Okay. Um, there are some, you can a foolproof way to know which one you have is to ask your servicer. So whomever you're making your payments to call them, they have to tell you if it's a private loan or a federal loan. There is also a website we could track people to where okay. they can check and that would be for federal loans. Um, and then also if you have a co-signer on a loan, it's most 
uh, it's most likely a private loan because the different ways that federal loans qualify people, um, they generally don't require a cosigner. That's really good info because I know yeah. once people have those payments and they just they just send out the payments and they don't know yeah. what they have and don't remember that step where they chose when they right. were in school. Okay, so what if that's that's really good info? But sort of, I can anticipate what some people may be thinking. Um, And that is, what if I have a few missed payments or when I graduated, I didn't immediately get in touch with my, you know, Mm -hmm. student loan service or whatever. What's the deal with late payments or statuses that are not or people that are in default or, you know, Mm -hmm. these different unfavorable things that we sometimes find ourselves in these situations? Sure. What's the thing on some of those? It's very common. Um, We see it a lot, especially because student loans often are sold. Um, and that can result in late payments if someone is um, not realizing where to make their new payment. Um, they also tend to report in duplicate, and that can be just incorrect. Um, but it, it is really important to make on-time payments with your student loans. If you have missed payments in the past, put some distance between that point and when you start applying for mortgage or get serious about looking at properties yeah. because you really should have a clean 12 month payment history, especially on FHA. These are installment loans and you know, they're, they're, they heavily impact your credit score, but also your ability to qualify for a mortgage is, you know, we do see a lot of lates, especially in the recent history. Yeah. Um, yeah, it's one or two. We tend to get an approval through our automated underwriting systems with an explanation. What happened? Um, is it taken care of now? Things like that. But um, truly, that's good to know. Have. So it's not it's not fatal necessarily. It's not fatal. But if you think about it, and a late on installment loan is is viewed, I would say, just below a late on a on a mortgage. And that can really sink your credit. So if you're yeah. having difficulty with a with your credit score by itself, um, you may be you may be looking at an FHA loan, and they in turn are going to look at the late payment on an installment debt pretty harshly. So yeah. it's important to sort of keep it keep it current within at least twelve months before you you try to buy. So if you, I guess it sounds like if you have had a mistake or some kind of issue yeah. with the late payment, just like make sure that you get it on track from that point forward and just yeah. freeze that in time. Because or even you, speak to a lender at that point so that they can assess, you know, just how long you really need to be making your on-time payments again um, and tell you a lot of times people are, aren't aware of what's on credit and how they report. So it's just a yep. good idea to to have your credit pulled maybe well in advance of when you actually this brings it. up a great point because I so often talk to people who are a year um, mm-hmm. 18 months six months from doing anything and they think oh I don't need to talk to anybody right now I don't want anybody to pull my credit right now it's not worth it to me to engage in this process now because oh I think I'm fine and Oh, I'll I'll engage, you know, in a year. Um, it really does help to have yeah. somebody to look at it. Um, can it's you talk about? Soon. Yeah, I, it, I, I, I agree. agree with you 100%. Experience has taught me that it's never too soon. But I, I find what a lot of people worry about is the impact of their credit score of a pull. Mm-hmm. Can you talk a little bit about what that is? Yeah, does and, I can I can touch on it briefly. I'm not credit expert despite this for 15 years, but um, there's a lot of things that go into your credit score. And one of them just happens to be the amount of times that you are triggering a credit pull and and checking your own score. Um, Generally, when they talk about mortgage uh, inquiries on credit, it's about opening um, store credit cards or checking your score monthly, like a hard pull. There's a lot of people that that use just a credit card statement that provides a, a, a vantage score or something along those lines of what your FICO is. There's there's a lot of different scoring models out there. Um, but in reality, it's, it's a necessary part of being approved for a loan. You can't skip it. You just have to do it and try to kind of restrict 
the number of um, inquiries to a small period of time, whether that's a week or two weeks or even just one month. Um, and then be finished with the shopping around uh, because generally you're going to get some important information with, uh, even if you speak to a few different lenders, they're going to give yep. you guidance based on what's on your credit. And if that inquiry is having a really big impact or not. Um, but I know people really fear that and they shouldn't because I think what's worse is getting yourself into a situation where you're under contract and then you have your credit pulled and last minute, you're like, wait a minute, you don't realize maybe what you need to work on and how it could impact your, your purchase or your contract. Yeah. And the pressure that you're mm -hmm. under at that moment when you have a 30 day window or 45 day window to get a loan closed right. is so much more stressful than getting a jump on it a year ahead of time, six months ahead of time to kind of see where you are um, right. and clean up needs to be cleaned up. So yeah. I think you that's can, great advice. You can, thank you. You can, you can d definitely make a lot of um, improvements for the better in a year's time. So if you do need, want to start early, I would recommend it. Um, if there's work to be done, it can be done in that much time. Okay. And what about, and I think we talked a little bit about when people are in school and kind of looking at that loan, student loan situation where you may not be in repayment yet. One, mm -hmm. one piece of advice that I have to people is if you are at the beginning of grad school and you're still working, um, it's a great time to make a real estate purchase uh, because you, that, that, that loan debt doesn't come into play mm -hmm. yet. And with the right kind of purchase, we're not saying max out your dollar amount, knowing that you're going to take on this debt and commit financial suicide. But sometimes it really can, especially if you are engaged and you want to buy as a couple mm -hmm. um, and you know this debt is coming, but you've got plenty of room for a mortgage right. payment and that. Um, it's mm -hmm. a great step to take to kind of um, get that going before you get your student loans going if we're talking about graduate school. I would agree. Um, <laughs> yeah. And if you are not done with borrowing yet, because Diana, correct me if I'm wrong, this is a snapshot in time, correct? So if you're 50% yes. through a program, right, and you don't yeah. have the balance that you will have, obviously the calculation will be less. Yes. And in the time that you're in school, you can benefit from the tax advantages of buying. If you buy a multi-unit property, the income yeah. that comes along with that is something that's transferable into an investment property at some point. There are so many opportunities around Chicago for you to actually improve your financial situation through a real estate purchase, uh, as long as you're tr strategic. Um, sure. Okay, so I am not sure if we have any questions coming in. Okay. But uh, what smart moves can, can somebody make right now if they have student loans and they're looking to buy a home, say, in the next year? Um, most importantly, get your paperwork in order. Um, don't be uh, digging around when it's go time to try to figure out what your monthly payment is. And you'd be surprised what a lot of people don't know. that Maybe they set up an online payment. They don't really think about it. Um, but getting that documentation and having it ready to go is yep. important. Um, and uh, obviously making sure you're making your payments on time. <laughs> yes, we touched on that. Yeah. <laughs> but I would say get a copy of your student loan uh, statement and um, have it handy because it, it, it may report very differently than what's on credit. So if you have that handy, it'll help both of us be able to tell you right away your pre-approval. Yep status. Okay. And we did talk about the fact that this is advice that is very custom, very individual. How can somebody get in touch with you to discuss their personal situation, Dana? Probably best via email. It's Dana at mybmortgage.com. That's D-A-N-A -A at M-Y-B-E mortgage.com. Perfect. And we're going to try to put some links uh, somewhere where you can find <laughs> Dana's information. And again, I'm Roz Dupitone with At Home Downtown at Keller Williams Realty in Chicago. 
And I am here to help you make your best decision on downtown Chicago real estate. Thanks for joining us. Thank you uh, and so we much hope to for having you. me. You're, you're absolutely welcome, Dana. Thanks for sharing so much of your, your great expertise. And uh, hopefully we can talk again soon about more mortgage related topics. So if you're watching this, whatever, wherever you're watching it, whether it's Facebook Live or Facebook after the fact, feel free to send your comments uh, about topics that you might be interested in, be they mortgage related or real estate related. We'd be happy to shoot something in the future that uh, kind of addresses those questions. Thank you so much for joining us and watching. Thank you.